uh, oh yeah, this little documentary from No Clip. Okay, let's yeah, let's watch this. Uh, how a teenager manufactured a viral video game hit, Choo Choo Charles documentary, by uh, No Clip. Um, I still have to play this. I have it. I will play it. I know. I know. I have a fucking backlog of shit I need to play. But I, even though I'm a giant chicken, I love horror games, so I I do want to play this. But yeah, let's watch this. Let's see. Let's see what we got in this little documentary. October 1st, 2021, a 19-year-old indie developer in a remote pocket of Washington State posted a trailer. It was a trailer for a horror video game called Choo Choo Charles, a game that didn't exist yet aside from a Steam page. The trailer went viral and wishlists started pouring in, and this young indie dev Gavin Eisenbeis suddenly yeah, I remember, had an audience uh, and a game. I remember when I first actually saw that, Yomi, I believe, I think you sent it to me? I think you're the one that sent it to me. Like, it was the video from, like, Twitter or something. And you basically said, you have to play this. <laughs> Aim to make. But this viral trailer wasn't happenstance. Neither was the game's genre, the look of its antagonist, or the engine it was using. It was all part of a plan. A strategy born from a developer with a ticking clock hanging over his head. You see, Gavin wanted to be a game developer, but his parents, like any good parents, wanted him to have an education to fall back on. He'd released a few indie games in the past, but Gavin needed a bona fide hit to convince his parents that he could bypass college and jump straight into professional game dev. With no formal training or industry connections, Gavin had a mountain to climb. To create a hit game, he was going to have to do something special, something that grabbed the attention of players around the world. In getting thousands of people to wishlist Choo Choo Charles, Gavin had made that crucial first step. Now all he had to do was make a hit game. I interviewed Gavin on the No Clip podcast a few weeks after that trailer first hit, and I was struck by how level-headed he was despite the tough road that he had ahead of him. Hype can be a death sentence if not handled the right way, and I was really interested in how he'd cope in not just making the game, but stopping his audience's expectations from running wild. This was, after all, a game made by a single developer. What happened with Choo Choo Charles over the next 15 months was fascinating, and so once the dust had settled, I traveled to the northern coast of Washington Olympic Peninsula to catch up with Gavin about how it all went down. The things that went right, the stuff that went wrong, the 4 out of 10 from IGN, and what all those fans Fuck eventually IGN. thought when they got their own hands on they give nines. Charles. They give nines to obvious shit games. I would not take IGN's score seriously. No one trusts IGN scores. They're literally their own meme. I liked meme. video games when I was younger, obviously, like pretty much everyone. And, you know, that eventually when I learned that you could just create <laughs> games on your own for free on your home computer, I just, I don't know, it's just an enthralling concept to me. I say I was a kindergarten dropout. Right. They'd give nine to Gollum, could you imagine? Until uh, I graduated in high school. I wonder what they did give it. I started on mobile. I really wanted to make a mobile game, so I did a game called Sumo Skies, about a skydiving sumo wrestler. Strange concept, but it, it sounded really cool as a, I don't know, 14 year old. I did a <laughs> game called Behind These Eyes, uh, I think when I was 16, 17, that was like my first real like PC game. Yeah, IGN can't game. rock the boat. Horrible game, but maybe out of money made quick. It Steam. I, I made a couple hundred bucks off of it, so I was, I was happy with it. A couple of smaller game jam games as well. Cloud Climber and My Friend is a Raven over the course of a couple years. And then I did My Beautiful Paper Smile, which was kind of my first major, like sort of serious commercial game. It did okay, but it wasn't quite where I wanted things to be. And then after that, I started doing Choo Choo Charles. So how old are you when you were releasing My Beautiful Paper Smile? I started that I actually one, remember that I game. say when I was 16 and finished it or published it actually like a month after I announced 
Choo Choo Charles. Right. So just like a, a year ago is when I finished that at like 20. Well, when did you start learning uh, a language and what was it? Never, I, I just used Blueprint. And it's um, that's actually why I started using Unreal Engine is because I specifically, I was like, I want to do this visual scripting thing. That sounds fun. And I just haven't had to change at all. It's, it's, it's worked well enough. I guess they just had their, their home right office now. PC just for, you know, whatever, e emails, web surfing, all that. And that was kind of where I first started. Wait a minute. Know, doing development Wait styles. a minute. Were they cool with you using it to make games? Yeah. Are you telling me they gave Gollum the same score they supposedly gave Choo Choo Charles game right here? Like, they gave the same score. Bitch, please. IGN. I swear. You fucking pieces of... <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. They limited my um, my development time, though. They, they, they had uh, screen time limits. That made me very angry, but I forgive you, Dad. <laughs> when he started uh, making video games, that was his way to to do this educational thing of learning how to make video games, but he, he would make video games and spend um, you know hours playing and testing his video games. So he was kind of getting around that, that screen time limit. What was Gavin like as a kid growing up? He was really smart, very creative. He and his brother used to do a lot of imaginary things. I kind of remember them making videos about gold mining and moonshining and all those kind of things. He took it very seriously from the very beginning, and I'd say probably when he started working on My Beautiful Paper Smile, that's when I knew that he was, he was gonna be doing this professionally. I could see that he was picking it up really fast, and he was doing high quality work, and he was getting better and better. It, it was easy to see that, that he knew what he was doing. The worry was knowing that video game development is a creative endeavor, it's an artistic work, and not everybody appreciates everybody's art. And he can do a good job, he could make a, a great game, but it doesn't mean that it'll be well received. And you know, there's a lot of starving artists out there. That was the worry. Is he going to spend all, all this time? And, yeah, I can understand. And maybe not have. A I can understand that from a parent's perspective. Like, you want to encourage your child to work for their dreams, to reach for their dreams, to be inspired, and, you know. But at the same time, it's like you're also the worry in the back of your head. Depending on what they're going to do, there's like always always this worry of they're going to do what they're lo they love but is it going to actually give them a life I don't know if I, I'm, I'm saying that right but I can understand it it's just it's it's the parents that take away that freedom of expression for me that ooh, make my blood boil it's like that's not parenting that's not parenting Like this, you're literally just traumatizing your kid from ever trying anything. A commercial success. He sent me some right. pics on PlayStation. Willie okay, I'll look. I'll look at them later. To, to I'll try to remember to look at them before, when he like, was I go still to bed or working something. on my beautiful paper smile. That was when we had the conversation about college. So originally, I would have been going to college. I think about a year before I started working on Choo Choo Charles. And so I kind of managed to get my way out of it because I signed a deal with a publisher on My Beautiful Paper Smile. So now I was legally obligated to, to work on that game and finish that game. By the time that that game finished, I'd started that's a, that's making money sneaky. off of some programming courses. And so yeah, college was starting to make a little bit less Phoenix, no one's I was surprised. making money kind of on my own. And then Choo Choo Charles went viral a few months after that and it's like okay yeah so this is this is something that i can you know work on and, and something that i could bet on yeah 
By the time Gavin started on this project, he had accumulated a healthy amount of solo dev experience for somebody his age. More importantly, he seemed Jesus to have a very good understanding of where his weaknesses lied, the areas he lacked experience. But even more importantly than that, perhaps, he knew that without an audience, none of that was going to matter. He could spend a year or two working on a game and have absolutely nobody play it if they never found out about it. So what he decided to do instead was to pitch a game to the internet and gauge interest from there. So how did he come up with the pitch? So the goal was to try and make it go viral. I had never gone viral with anything before, so I didn't know if it would actually work. I just did everything that I could. So that was kind of the goal. And so I had kind of a, a bit of a unique perspective having done YouTube for a bit, not super successfully, but I kind of understood the content creator mindset, I guess. It was a big point for me to try to do anything I could to like make the game go just just be more inherently viral. I mean, obviously a big one is Spider Train. Spider Train is a is a pretty big part of that. But there's so much stuff. Like yeah, it's just definitely eye catching. <laughs> art style, the visual elements to the gameplay, trains, color schemes. It's just a lot of the name. The name, yeah, lots of stuff. You know, horror games. They all the time they'll take something that's cute or innocent and they'll make it scary. You know, oh, evil dolls, evil animatronics, whatever it might be. And so I was kind of realizing that there weren't many horror games or horror movies that kind of played off of uh, like kids TV shows. And like, those are huge. I mean, everybody has watched a kids TV show as a kid. And so my favorite one growing up was Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> so like, well, you know, a train-based game would actually be kind of cool. So that's where the initial concept of a train-based game came from. So I was like, well, okay, you could have a train monster. And then I had seen Tom Coben's animations pop up over the years. He's done like these cursed Thomas, Thomas.exe type things where it's like a spider Thomas. And so I was like, you know, I could just kind of sort of take the spider legs and just sort of put them on uh, this new character. And um, so that's where that came from. So I spent about a month working on the game, putting in place enough mechanics that I could make a trailer. Because in, in the indie world, exposure is everything, traffic is everything, and you want to try and start marketing as soon as possible. So I was like, all right, I need to get my trailer yeah, out. Yeah, really you really did Steam page really well on marketing. I'm just going to get some basic gameplay in. I don't care if there's bugs, anything like that. Whip together a trailer in a month and put that out on Twitter, and it took off immediately. So that yeah. was from, like, no dev to trailer amount of dev was one month. Yes. Wow, that's crazy. And so, had you used Unreal before? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I'd, I'd been using Unreal for probably six, seven years at that point. It was my first, like, big, like, first-person game, so it was still a, a bit of a, a learning curve, but, yeah. So, it goes viral, like, straight away? Yeah, like, day one. Okay, so... Well, I had... day two. Day two is when it hit its peak. Uh, what was that like? Uh, it was overwhelming. <laughs> a bit. A, bit, a good overwhelming, though. Yeah, I, I was kind of just glued to, to Twitter and YouTube, just reloading. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy to see it. it. It was the first time in as long as I've been making games that something went to plan and better. <laughs> Everything had always gone worse than, than I hoped for, so this, this was a nice change of pace. Day one, dropped the trailer. It started picking up some steam. I think it got maybe 20, 30,000 views or something on Twitter, which was which was great for me. That was way more than I'd ever done. I think on YouTube, it got maybe 10 or 20,000, did a little bit of, uh, you know, some numbers on Reddit, and that translated to about a thousand wish lists. And I was like, holy crap, a thousand wish lists. That's, that's awesome. That's a lot. That was like the most I'd ever gotten in one day on, uh, on any of my games. And then day two came around and it pulled maybe, I think maybe like <laughs> a, a million or close to a million on Twitter, and then a little bit more on Reddit. And that translated to, 14,000 wish list and that was my new biggest day now <laughs> that was when I was like okay so this is actually this is this is something like for my beautiful paper smile it took me three years to get that many wish lists and I just did this in a day it did like 80,000 wish lists in the first couple weeks and a hundred thousand in I guess probably in the first month or so what, what was it at when you launched damn when I launched it was at 550,000 <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was pretty happy with that. Was, was good, good I would say, yeah, I'd be happy too. <laughs> I 
Yeah, I remember first watching it at first. At first. Oh, Jesus Christ. At first, when I first watched it, I thought you were literally in the train the whole time. And then I discovered you're okay, like, no, you, you run around. It's an open map area thing. For, <laughs> for those of you who haven't played it, Choo Choo Charles is a game that takes place on an island where the community is being terrorized by a large spider train. You play as an outsider as who has come does. in to Everyone help the does. islanders, you know. and you do this by upgrading your own train with new weapons and collecting a set of eggs, which will trigger a climactic battle. The island also has a host of interesting side quests and piles of scrap that you can use to upgrade your train. It's a tight loop and the game can be completed in a handful of hours. So how did Gavin scope out this project? What problems did he run into? Where did he spend most of his development time? And where did he cut corners to meet his one-year development deadline? I pretty much had the general gameplay loop honed in before I placed a single node. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a big thing for me is because I'm very focused on format, you know, because like in making a game inherently viral, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that needs to be really baked into the, just the core of the game. And so a lot of the gameplay elements, like being able to drive a train around, the fact that it's open world, that stuff was important to have in place right from the start. So that was just like in the first few weeks that I was kind of concepting the game, that was when that stuff came in. The story, the mob and Warren and all like that kind of stuff, shrines and all that, that came in very late. The The story went through, I think, three major shifts. I probably had four different scripts that I went through. So that stuff I was playing around with constantly until about six months for launch is when I finally sort of nailed that Damn. in. Damn. So the first thing that I kind of had to do was just get the island itself, getting the track system set up, you know, kind of mapping out where generally I wanted like points of interest to be around the map, just getting the, the rail system. That was kind of the first big thing. It's just making it so you could actually get around the map. After that, I think it was... Yeah, could you uh, imagine getting, building like, all this and then you realize you can't actually get, so made, like, get the train to go missions, around all the tracks or anything? Went in and did the different <laughs> weapon missions, went in and did the side missions, and then kind of throughout that time, I was also the working on right here, kept you know, improving right Charles' now. AI. That I'm was almost afraid that was, to that ask. Pain. I had to go through a lot of iterations just throughout development. Like, if I had tried to make the game in a short period of time, it wouldn't have worked because Charles' AI would have been just horrible. <laughs> so that was something that needed just years to mature just making sure he actually is able to navigate effectively that was that was a pain it was really easy for him to get stuck lies especially with him being as large as he is one of the first things i had to do was add various tests and checks in order to check if he's stuck having different stages of like what he'll do if he does get stuck so like first step if he gets stuck he'll run around in a circle until he gets unstuck if that doesn't work and he's still not moving then he has to like teleport to a new location. And if that still doesn't work, then it'll keep teleporting until he gets to a location where he like actually has navigation. And that was another thing is like, when you've got like these steep cliffs and stuff, it's difficult getting the AI to like run effectively up a cliff. You know, it's common for him to like slide into areas. Since, cause also Shows since he's so big and heavy, he has to kind of like drift is. around oh a little God. bit. So that results in him sliding out of the navigation mesh into areas where he just gets stuck. So then he has to have more additional checks in case he slides out of out of bounds. Let's see, what are some other things? I mean, just the difficulty, just, just balancing it, you know? That took a lot of time, just a lot of tuning, just having people try it out and say like, oh, okay, this is a little difficult in the beginning, a little hard later on. There's like a slight dynamic difficulty system, just kind of a basic one, like depending on how leveled up your train is, he'll be scared off more easily or, you know, or less easily. His patrolling system, that was another big one. Because if you have a spider train in a massive island that's just walking around randomly, you'll never find him. He'll just be somewhere. It'll, you know, he'll just be in a pit, he'll be in a cave, he'll just be walking around in circles somewhere, and you'll, you won't see him the entire game. And people probably wouldn't enjoy buying a game called Choo Choo Charles if they never saw Choo Choo Charles. So, yeah, yes, that'd I be a little awkward. Design handful of different systems that I tried using for that. First one was where every like 10 or 20 minutes he would randomly just attack you. 
but that was kind of a problem because it felt very unfair to be like sitting in a building and then all of a sudden you see over the top of a mountain three miles away Charles charging straight towards you pinpointing you um, that didn't feel very good people didn't like that I didn't even like that it was pissing me off while I was uh, testing the game right so I, I decided you know what maybe I should change that up a bit Encounters with Charles were most fun when you could kind of see him nearby and you could effectively avoid him. I ended up going with a system where he essentially, he always knows where the player is, but he spirals around them and he gets closer and farther depending on, you know, various timers and, and stuff. So that way he'll be far away, you know, like right after you fought him or after you've spawned in and started the game so that you're totally safe. And then a little later on, he'll get a little closer and you can kind of see him over the hills for a bit. So you get kind of a warning and then he comes in a little bit closer to where you start hearing the music. And so then it's like, you know, maybe you have some close, close encounters. And then, you know, if you survive that, you know, and you can avoid him for a few minutes, then it'll start kind of like going back out and it'll give you a few minutes to get back to your train or whatever. And so tuning that pattern as well, just the scaling of his patrolling zone, that was another thing that just, it, it took months of just playing and adjusting and playing and adjusting until it felt natural. It, it's weird, in order to make something feel natural, it has to be so unnatural behind the scenes. Well, aside from Charles' AI, the other most difficult thing would have been the mob AI, which was 10 times worse. Got those but masks, yo. Honestly, <laughs> I regret having the mob in the game at all because those stealth sections, people did not like them. The wrong place, my friend. That's probably one of the biggest complaints I've had. So, and their AI was a pain, so that made it even worse. It's like I, I spent lots and lots and lots of time trying to make that AI and that stealth stuff work, and it just didn't, it, it still fell flat. The, the game, like from a technical standpoint, it's not that crazy. I'm not really doing anything that hasn't been done before. So it was mostly pretty simple. One of the biggest things probably would have just been like the open world environment design stuff. That was pretty tedious. There was a lot of stuff to do. That was probably a solid four months of development, just day in, day out. I did a lot of live streams of it as well um, to, to try and make it a little bit less tedious, which did help. The, the scrap economy took a little bit of balancing, just figuring out like, okay, how much should this stuff cost? How much, you know, how effective should the upgrades be? That stuff just took some balancing over time. Again, it was one of these things where it's just months of, you know, as more people play it, you know, you figure out which strategies are really overpowered and which ones are just horrible that everybody avoids. It was just balancing over time. But it, the scrap system and upgrade system and the, you know, getting the, the weapons from mission, uh, that, that was always there. Why don't you bring that box of rocket ammunition back here from inside the bunker down the rail? Yeah. So during those 15 months, you're obviously doing so much of this work. Well, he didn't Do say that with his mouth. Was it way? like... Or is there people helping with, with his mind? lighting or animation <laughs> or music or anything? Like, who, Do you have any other collaborators uh, on this project? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I use, you know, like some pre-made assets here and there. You know, there's a lot of, you know, like trees that I didn't make myself. So, you know, help in, in that way. I hired a, a musician to do some original tracks. I had a friend who helped me out with kind of the lore side of things and the, the backstory. My family helped me out a lot with like kind of editing the script. My brother, he contributed a lot of top tier jokes to the game. Who's responsible for Pickle Lady? Pickle Lady was me. <laughs> that was me. I, I take responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have a lot of people playtesting until probably the last three months of development. So I had just like friends and family testing it early on, which was part of where some of the, the stress stuff was coming from. Cause like I, I had no idea how good or bad the game was because not enough people had played it. Initially, like I, it didn't even cross my mind that people would care about facial animations or that people would dislike my Fuse characters, I was like, well, what's wrong with my Fuse characters? They look great. So I just wasn't expecting people to even notice at all in, in the first place. And then people did notice. By the time I actually knew that people would have liked it to be higher quality, it was too late in development to make changes like that anyways. But as far as like the broader scope of those sort of decisions, I guess kind of well, my to main be fair to decision making him, process is like he, he had a set time limit and he was doing it by himself basically so 
or are they going to write a positive review if I do add this feature? And anything else, it's like I, I still want to have like a little bit of extra, you know, I want to meet expectations and go a little bit above, but a lot of developers, they, they think that a feature is really important that actually isn't. So it's also just like for me personally, I like simple games. I like a game that I can sit down and start playing and I don't need to spend five hours getting into it for it to, you know, get good. Yeah, I feel that. <laughs> Most of it can be boiled down to fetch quest, get this item from this place. But I tried to make it so like there was, you know, oh, this one has a goofy character, or this one takes place in a slightly different environment, or, you know, this one you have to do parkour, you know. Oh, damn, there were both, both your legs. Tools down like a month before launch. And so leading up to launch, I basically had a month where it was just emailing, you know, content creators, reaching out to, you know, just sending keys to, to people, working on YouTube videos, devlogs, TikToks, just the whole marketing campaign stuff. Ultimately, I mean, it, it went pretty well leading up. I was able to get done most of the stuff uh, that I wanted to get done. I did a live stream where I actually launched the game on stream. Um, and you know, for the past couple weeks, I'd been promoting like the specific hour and the, the times that like everybody knew when it was exactly when it was dropping. So I, you know, on the live stream, press the launch button, release my app. We press release now. Damn, that'd be something to be able to literally just live stream your game going there were live. Probably four or five points throughout development where the pressure got really high. It was one of these things where I knew no matter when I released the game, people were going to play it. And the big thing that I had to worry about is what are they going to like it? <laughs> there were various points throughout development when I would be playing the game or I'd have a friend playing the game and I'd realize, oh, like this, this really sucks. This is actually not a good game at this point. Um, pressure went up and you know up and down, and then I would like fix a bunch of stuff, and I'd be feeling good about it, and I'd have somebody else play, and then it's like, oh, it still sucks. By the time <laughs> it got to launch, I was pretty confident in it. I'd spent plenty of time, you know, probably three months just in polishing, just having I just had hundreds of people play testing it and giving tons of feedback. So I was I was pretty happy with you know the feedback that I was getting by launch. So the pressure on launch day, I mean, it was high, but it was pretty manageable. You had, you had some confidence in it. Yeah, I, I had some confidence in it. We just intently watch the spinny box. Well, let's start reloading the, the Steam page. Hey, I think it's out. I think it's out, guys, go check it. And uh, let me know in chat, is it out? Is it out? Closed down the stream. When started checking numbers, I went to YouTube immediate, you know, I, I sent out codes to like content creators like two weeks beforehand. So a flood of videos like immediately as, as the game came out, um, started watching those, started checking the, the player count on SteamDB because you, you know, you don't get the, the sales figures until a, a little bit later and, and it started like the player count just started going up and I was like, oh, that's already higher than I was expecting it to be just in the first <laughs> few minutes there. And I was kind of just able to sit back and, and watch it. There weren't really any major bugs. Like that was kind of my big fear going into it. I, I think that's like every developer's worst nightmare is that there's going to be a game breaking bug on launch. Thankfully, I had gotten all of that stuff under control during kind of the, the testing phase. Yeah, see this indie no developer issues. by I, himself. I was able to take the whole weekend and just was able to launch a game watch everything without unfold, a major game-breaking nice. bug. Yeah, I mean, like I was watching playthroughs and triple A um, developers. To make sure that people weren't getting take stuck note. anywhere. You know, I was checking, you know, reviews in the community hub on Steam, trying to make sure that there wasn't anything um, going bad. And there were a couple small things that I ironed out over the, the following like week. Yeah, for the most part, it, it ended up being fine. All throughout the development process, since you know it was gaining steam, no pun intended, um, <laughs> all the way through, you know, for the whole year. So I had plenty of content creators that reached out to me and I had a list of, 
you know, email addresses and all the people who were interested and who had talked about the game or who had, you know, tweeted about the game and all this stuff. So I had a list of people who I already knew were interested. And actually, I think I only emailed people who were already <laughs> interested in the game. It ended up, you know, going pretty well. I think pretty, pretty much everybody that I was hoping would play it did. You know, all my all my favorite channels that, you know, that I've been watching forever. Probably the one that I was most excited to see was John Wolf. I've been a been a fan of his channel for quite a while. I'd probably credit him with a lot of my game design knowledge, honestly. His his critiques on on stuff cuz it's, it's a very honest, level-headed approach to like critiquing stuff. And so watching all of his horror game playthroughs over time, that's that's been a a big help. So seeing him play through it was really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm I'm really enjoying it. Oh, 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 oh. I saw some scrap. <laughs> Some of them, you know, have played my previous game, so I've I've kind of experienced it already. You know, No Snake Hotel is a little game that I did on my YouTube channel for a, for sort of a challenge. You know, that got played by a bunch of people. Same with my my beautiful paper smile. That one got played a bit as well. So it was wasn't a foreign feeling, but it, it was really really cool to see them enjoying another one. Yeah, the the reaction from fans was was phenomenal. The the people who I wanted to enjoy it enjoyed it thoroughly and that that has me very very happy i mean that's where like like any stress that i had leading up to launch that's where it was you know that's where it stemmed from that's pretty seeing, damn awesome you know, my, honestly my subscribers and the people who had been following me throughout the development journey seeing them really happy with it that was awesome reception from like press i can't say i was expecting good scores i wasn't really expecting press to like it it's one of those things where it's like you know, for a game as like lighthearted and just like that doesn't really take itself seriously, like it's like a half meme game, half serious game. I just knew that press wouldn't be into that, so I wasn't too worried about no, it. No, it's because they're Were you personally dumb fucks. offended by the four out of ten from IGN, or was it like a? No, not not really. I, I actually I avoided the same it for for quite a while. Eventually, score I did. I like, oh, as Gollum. Like, Think about that. I mean, he's got some valid points. I mean. Four out of ten, a little wild, but a little lower than I was expecting. But it seemed like a game that they often wouldn't usually review. Actually. Right, that, yeah. that's the weirdest thing to me is that as many press folks reviewed it as they yeah, did. Yeah, like, they treated it. Press like like it's IGN. Spider Troy, why are you even looking at this? <laughs> IGN is so fucking stupid. They 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 treat a game made by one dude in less. What what he? How long did he say he had? He had like a year and a half or something like that like 16 months or something like that to make this game by himself he's an indie developer basically and they're comparing this game to like triple a games that these days can barely start we usually have like a day one patch that's like 50 gigabytes or more they'll give those nines out of tens but not this. Not this. They give this a four. The same score as Gollum. I'm not going to forget that. <laughs> I'm not, like, that's going to be stuck in my mind. I'm just, the sheer disbelief I have over that. <laughs> that, that was the part that confused me the most. Uh, I was very excited. Um, very relieved for him because I wanted it to be well received. Um, and I wanted it to, you know, I, the IGN rating. That bummed me out, but it, it didn't seem to bother him too terribly much. Right, and obviously the sort of wider reception was mm -hmm. yeah. overwhelmingly positive. Yeah, it was great to see the high reviews on Steam and watch playthroughs and see, seeing people really like it. So it was good to see that it it appeared that it was going to be commercially successful and that uh, it, it would give him um, some breathing room to be able to. You know, survive and you know, be able to work on another project and keep doing this, this thing that he wants to do. I've been watching him work for a long time and you know he was working on Choo Choo Charles while he was still living at home with us and you know he he was kind of a workaholic about it but you know I watched him learn all the different facets of the gaming industry and so I knew if anybody could do it he could do it and I knew he was being very systematic about uh, the game development and 
the marketing and fully understanding the big picture of, of how to be successful. Basically, as soon as I started making games, I knew that that was what I wanted to do. And I was like, no matter how long it takes, eventually I'll have a successful game and whatever time I spent in college, whatever money I spent in college, it'll become worthless. You know, so even if it's 10, 15 years down the line, eventually this is going to happen or I will die. <laughs> One of the two things. <laughs> How is the success? A little dramatic, but your, also true. Your day -to -day I get it. I get it. You're looking at in the future. Kind of the main thing is, you know, it, it gives me breathing room. You know, it gives me time to, you know, get, get the porting figured out. You know, I'm able to outsource that. Yeah, ultimately, it's just, it gives me time to figure out the next project and do the next project right and, and do it better, you know? It's like the game is done well enough and the YouTube channel is done well enough that like, you know, like I don't need to make crazy big games or anything. As I've continued researching game development and just doing game development, I keep on finding like, oh wait, I could do something cooler. Like I could improve on this mechanic or that mechanic or all these different things. I just want, I, I want to see how far I can push it. You know, I, I feel like there's a lot more that I can do and you know a lot more games that I could make so it's like I still feel like I need to be you know working as hard as I you know did on Choo Choo Charles for for the next games so you know I mean there's there's probably going to be some a little bit more audience carryover since I do have like the YouTube channel and stuff but it, it doesn't I feel like it doesn't give too much security like every game kind of has to stand on its own two feet Funky potato. Oh man, that's pretty. That's a badass story, though. That's pretty awesome. Like I'm glad for the dude. Like he went. He went for his dream. He put in the work. I can't wait to see what else he comes up with, honestly. Cause it's like, they, they showed off a couple of the games he's already, he's made in the past, and it's like, completely different from this. So he's not just sticking with one style and then just redoing it over and over again. Like he wants to get out there and make something new or different or improve on something. God, I know I'm going to shit myself when I play this game. I'm going to have a heart attack playing this. <laughs> For a split second, I was going to... I expected the person to walk out and just get like fucking ran over. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? <laughs> Oh man, that's good. That's good. Another good uh, little documentary from No Clip. Uh, yeah, let me see. It's No Clip Docs. Yeah, check them out. They got a lot of good documentaries. They've they've done a lot uh, on developers and stuff. Like I know they have like a whole. I think there's like. I don't know, like a three-part series of documentaries for the Final Fantasy. <gasps> and the trouble it went through in the reboot and... Oh. Yeah. Another good documentary. Check it out. They're good.